Hello. So um, I would like to talk about our work on mapping the brain and how machine learning has become an absolutely essential component of it. So I'm going to talk about the brain, but I'm just a, a lowly computer scientist. So I tend to think, to think about these things as computers with circuits, except, of course, what we are dealing with is that. And in the brain, uh, the circuits exist, of course. They are in wetware as opposed to hardware. And that wetware is made of neurons, uh, connections, called axons and dendrites, and connectors, synapses. So one of the things we would like to be able to do is to generate the map of all this, the circuit diagram with the hope that someday we might understand how it works. And why would we want to do that? Well, first, because it's fascinating. It's one of the big questions of science. What is the brain? How does it work? But this is about this conference is about applications, and there are many. Because, of course, if you understood how it works, you would also understand better what the effect of diseases are, how they affect the brain, and how you could try to cure them. So a big one are all the neurodegenerative diseases. And for people like me with gray hair, we, of course, all hope that we make great advances really quickly. Um, and what are we going to use the, to do this? Well, we're going to use images. And these images are typically obtained with microscopes. So here's an example of you take a poor, unsuspecting rat and you open his skull. And that's what you're going to see. Because these rats actually have been genetically engineered so that when you shine a laser light on it, it fluoresces. The part of the brain circuitry fluoresces. So if you zoom in a bit more, you, that's what you see. So that's done with what's called um, a two-photon microscope. This is optical microscopy. And these things here, this spaghetti soup, all these dendrites and axons, in other words, the wires that connect the neurons. And then you can zoom even more, and you see this. So this is done with a different kind of microscope called an electron microscope that has a much higher resolution. So this was a pixel here, a dot in this image is one micrometer cube. A dot in one of these is five nanometer cube, which means 200 times higher. So at this resolution, what you are seeing here, you see inside the cells. So you see the neurons, and within the neurons, you see things like mitochondria. You, I mean, I'm nearsighted that I don't see the synapses, but they are there. And what you would want to do is take this imagery and essentially produce a 3D structure that represents those, uh, those brain structures. And one way I think about this, it's like Google Maps. If you start with Google Maps, as you zoom in, you will see overlays that represent the roads, the rivers, the towns, whatever. This is the same thing. This is Google Brain in some sense. You would want to be able to do the same thing and to create those overlays. The problem is, the, you've all heard the term big data, but this is really big. So I think one of the previous speaker mentioned petabytes, lots of petabytes. I'm going to go one better. And if you uh, count in a brain, typical human brain, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses, I mean, these numbers are so big, they don't mean anything anymore. And if you were to take a human brain and digitize it at the resolution I just showed you, uh, it would take, so that's a heptabyte, I think a thousand exabytes, just to store the data uncompressed. So that's not a number that means anything to me, but just to put it in perspective, 
a few years ago, I read that Amazon, the company Amazon, had a total storage capacity of one hexabyte. OK, you, times has passed. They probably have more now, so let's say twice more. You still need 500 Amazons to store one brain. That's a lot of data. And so that has now become the bottleneck. We know how to acquire the images, but we don't know how to store them, how to process them, how to extract useful information for them. And having an army of PhD students draw on these images by hand is not a solution. It just doesn't scale up. So um, that's where machine learning and more generally computer vision is going to be needed. You need it to actually make sense out of this. And I'd like to show in the remainder of the talk how to do this for two specific problems. One is how do you delineate this, how do you follow these wires? How do you entangle this spaghetti soup to see what's connected to what? And the second is how do you model these intracellular structure, the connectors, the synapses, and the mitochondria, which actually are the batteries of the cell, to see what kind of shape they, ha they have and how they can be studied and quantified. And the hope, of course, is someday we will be able to build this Google map, this multi-layer map of a whole brain. But as we'll see, we are still some distance away from that. So let's start with the dendrites. So I really like this image. This is another rat or a mouse, perhaps. And this one has been genetically engineered so that the dendrites glow in different colors when you shine the laser light on them. So that actually helps. It's exactly like when you have wires in the, you know, the electricity of this room. You have red wires and blue wires and yellow wires because it helps to connect things together. So that's what's been done. So the color actually helps to be able to distinguish between all these wires. And then you can have, an, again, an unfortunate grad student who is going to probably spend months doing this. Or you can have an algorithm like the one we've developed that does this automatically. So this is actually nice. It also works, I mean, the same algorithm works on blood vessels, because blood vessels are also linear structures that have a kind of a graph structure. So here is an image. And from this image, you can actually extract the pattern of these blood vessels. And if there were a problem, for example, you would see it. Or, and that's different, you can also use this, and now we are getting to Google, to you give it an aerial image, and it will find the roads, which also are linear structures that form a graph. And what's interesting about the, these three examples is that in all three cases, we used exactly the same algorithm. And the secret sauce is machine learning, because what we did is to use training data of all three, for all three different categories of linear structures, train the algorithm to recognize them, and then run that algorithm. So that's extremely useful. And in a practical setting, it's even more useful because this has been alluded to several times. It's very hard to get. That's actually the roadblock for all machine learning uh, algorithms. You need the data. You need to bootstrap the thing. And acquiring your data is hard, expensive, and painful, generally speaking. So what these machine learning algorithms allow you to do is to train in one domain, for example, on the roads where delineation is actually relatively easy because it's 2D. And then with a little more training data, retrain for the more complex domains. And that is actually, it's known, it's a technique known as transfer learning. And that probably also will be a key component of making these things truly practical. 
Okay, so that was the linear structures. Let's talk a little bit about these at the higher resolution, these synapses, the connectors, and the mitochondria, which are these things, which are the battery packs that are in our cells and allow them to function. And why are we interested in those structures specifically? Because, well, we are trying to build uh, to find out how an electric circuit works. So these are critical components, and it has been observed that in neurodegenerative diseases, these, they are called organelles, get deformed. They get messed up. But messed up is kind of a vague, it is a very vague word, and neuroscientists want actual quantitative descriptions. They want statistics about them. And that's what we're going to give them. So uh, again, here uh, is the data we start with. This is the electron micro microscopy stack. I should have said that when I talk about images, in general, I, I talk about stacks of images because we are looking at the volume. So the same at a higher resolution, we are going through the slices. And from the slices, we can find mitochondria using a deep net called the UNet, which has been shown in a, again in a previous slide, in a previous talk. Uh, we can find the synapses, and from this we can produce a raw result. These are the mitochondria in that particular brain volume. And then we can clean them up a bit to get this. And um, the result of this is we've actually tried to hear the, the proof of the pudding is, are we, going, are we able to speed this up enough to be able to deal with truly large amount of, uh, of brains? So actually, not quite yet. We can go from here to a lot less manual intervention we can get a factor, I think, I don't remember the number, but five or six, which is good, but not quite good enough yet. So really, the push now is to automate more and more and more so that we get a factor 100 or a factor 1,000, which is what we truly need to make this practical. Nevertheless, we can still already use this to do some kind of study. So here's one that I think is fun. Uh, comparing synapses in young and old mice. So you, you run this on brain samples from young and old mice, you find the synapses and you look at their size, or equivalently at their surface area. And what you find is that, so first, we all have this notion that when you, as you grow older, you lose, you lose your marbles, you lose synapses or neurons or something. Um, and the experimental evidence is yes, but it's a bit more complicated than that. So in terms of the synapses, what seems to be happening is that indeed you, the old mice have fewer synapses, but they are bigger. It's kind of... It's kind of a conservation of synaptic something. I mean, I'm making this up. This is not scientific proof. And what's fun about this is it's kind of, you, you shouldn't anthropomorphize too much. But it seems to support this idea that as you get older, the connection, you get set in your ways. And in some sense, the result of that experiment could be interpreted that way until somebody comes up with a different experiment to prove something else, which seems to happen all the time in neuroscience. And of course, to achieve this goal of the Google map that does things at all scales, we need to bring these structures built at different resolution together. And this is also something we've worked on so here, what this thing is, is the cube of electron microscopy. Very high resolution. The light microscopy at much lower resolution. You can 
try to find where the hydrogen cube comes from, place it correctly, bring the two things together, and produce essentially a final result where you have the tubes, the wires, and within the wires you have the structures. So of course, I think this is nice, but of course it remains preliminary, it's much too small. So now the, the challenge is, coming back to my big data problem is, we can work on small volumes, now we have to scale it up seriously and Clearly, machine learning is to be a key. And another key, of course, would be to find the data to train the algorithms, find good methods to bootstrap and making this practical, and really scale it up to the size of the whole problem. And that probably will keep us amused for a few more years. Thank you. <laughs>